Good evening. evening. And welcome all of you to this midweek Lenten service at St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church. Welcome also to those of you who worship with us online. Our church is located at 1200 East Genesee Street in Frankenmuth, Michigan, and I am Pastor Patrick Ernst. Tonight we continue our theme series as we go through the Passion history, Speaking of Jesus. We hear words that swirled around Jesus during his Passion sometimes spoken about him, sometimes to him, but always more profound than anyone might have realized. Tonight, we consider the words of the crowd at Jesus' trial who said, His blood be on us. We use the order of service as it's printed in the bulletin. We begin with the confession of sin. Please stand. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of God, our Heavenly Father, to render thanks for the great benefits we have received at his hand, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and salvation. O come, let us worship him. Let us kneel and bow down before him. Let us confess our sins with penitent hearts, and obtain forgiveness by his infinite grace and mercy. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed the devices and desires of our hearts. We have offended against your holy law. We have done those things which we should not have done, and we have not done those things which we should have done. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Spare us and restore us according to the promises you have declared to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. For his sake, grant that we may live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. The Almighty and merciful Lord has granted us pardon and forgiveness of all our sins grace for true repentance and amendment of life, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated for the opening hymn. We sing hymn 516, stanzas 1 through 4, and stanza 8.
O Lord, open my lips. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. may be seated for the Passion History. Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers of the governor led him away into the praetorium. They gathered the whole band of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a purple robe on him. When they had woven a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. They knelt down and did him homage. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I bring him out to you, that you may know I find him not guilty. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I do not find him guilty. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you, and I have power to release you? Jesus answered, You would not have any power at all over me unless it had been given to you from above. For that reason, he who handed me over to you has the greater sin. This prompted Pilate to go on trying to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king sets himself against Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was the preparation of the Passover, about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold, your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but rather a riot was underway, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this man. See to it yourselves. Then all the people responded, His blood be on us and on our children. Then Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, gave sentence that it should be as they demanded. He released to them Barabbas, for whom they asked, the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. He had Jesus flogged and then gave him over to their will to be crucified. The soldiers mocked him, stripped him of the purple robe, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Here ends the Passion History. O Lord, have mercy upon us. 
thanks be to you, O Lord. We sing the next hymn. Here are the words for our consideration this evening taken from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 27. Pilate said to them, that is the crowd, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. We pray. Heavenly Father, this is your word, and these are your people. I pray for them. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Dear fellow redeemed, one of the more well-known plays that William Shakespeare wrote is called Macbeth. It's not quite as familiar maybe as Romeo and Juliet or Hamlet, but it's up there among the most performed plays that Shakespeare wrote. The general plot line of the play goes like this. It's a, a tragedy about political ambition. There's a general in Scotland named Macbeth, and three witches 
tell him that he's going to be king of Scotland someday. So he believes this, and in order to make that prediction come true, he and his wife, his wife's known as Lady Macbeth, kill the king. King Duncan is his name. So they kill him, and Macbeth becomes king, but then there's a bloodbath as Macbeth has to commit all these other murders to try and keep control and to cover up his crime. Macbeth and his wife become, we would say, mentally unstable because of all this that's happening and all the things that they're doing. His wife, Lady Macbeth, who, who really pushed him to kill the king so that he could get power, is just racked with guilt and she starts sleepwalking. Her doctor sees her sleepwalking one night and in her deranged state, he sees her trying to wash from her hands imaginary blood stains from the blood of King Duncan. He hears her yelling, out damn spot, out I say trying to get rid of this blood, trying to get rid of this guilt. And she can't. That water won't wash it away. Now, there are all kinds of crimes that people can commit. But because humans are the crown of God's creation, we do think of murder as kind of a unique crime, don't we? The taking of another human life. We know as a society that we have to take care of those people whom we send to kill others for us, right? Soldiers or executioners. We recognize that there are mental, there are spiritual, there are emotional scars from doing that kind of work, even if they do it with a good conscience in a way that God actually condones. Taking a human life is a real burden that people bear. In Jesus' trial before Pilate, what's so shocking is that this crowd of Jews wants that guilt on themselves. Pilate gives them permission to crucify Jesus, but you can tell he doesn't give his wholehearted approval to it. He completes this symbolic gesture of washing his hands with water in front of everyone to say, I am going to be clean of any guilt that comes from the blood this man Jesus will bleed as you crucify him. In contrast, how does the crowd respond to the news that they can crucify Jesus? When they finally get the go-ahead to kill, they say, bring it on. Let his blood be on us and on our children. They want to go down in history for future generations to know that they were the ones who rid the nation of this man. When Jesus finally is crucified, they will be credited with Jesus' blood. But we're going to see tonight how we also, with faith, should pray his blood be on us and on our children. Pilate was a rank unbeliever. He was a pagan. We know from scripture and other sources that he was not that concerned with killing innocent people. And even he's hesitant to sentence Jesus to death. So why is it that the Jews want this death on their record? I think part of what's going on here is this crowd is so entrenched in the way that they have always thought, especially about the Messiah and what kind of work he would really do. They have these preconceived notions about God and how he works but it never occurs to them that they might be on the wrong side of all of this. And even though we weren't standing there crying for Jesus to be crucified, that same tendency happens with us. You know, in construction or in building, there's this idea of something being grandfathered in. You've maybe heard of this in other trades too. Something is grandfathered in. In building, that means... You could buy an old house, and there might be things in that house that are out of code. They're not in line with the current building code. Maybe it's your electrical system or the way your house was shingled years ago. But you can leave it because it was done before this current building code came into effect. We can use that as a picture. Think of yourself as that house. 
All of your thoughts and words and actions are little building projects and renovations that you do in that house and you, in your life and your habits, you try to keep this house up. And think of repentance as a house inspection. When we repent, when we try to own up to our sins, we are looking through the house of our life and trying to see if there's anything unsound or dangerous or improperly built in that house. God's word, if you will, is the building code that we use as the final standard. When we confess our sins and claim God's forgiveness, God is going through our house and finding those problem spots and he's demolishing them and then he builds something good and new with his forgiveness and by directing us to what's right. What I think we all need to watch out for is sins that we have grandfathered in to our lives. Parts of our lives that are not in line with God's law, with his code, but they're ideas or habits that we've had for so long that we don't really challenge them anymore. You could say when we do the inspection and renovation that is repentance, We let those parts of our lives sit because they were built maybe even long before we ever knew that they were sinful. But just as the Jews were so convinced of their rightness, we also can not only disguise these sins but even defend them as something good when we don't let the light of God's word truly shine on them. So let me illustrate this in a couple areas of life. The first one, which is so far-reaching, think of how you treat your spouse or your friends or your relatives. Think about how you resolve conflicts with people because that's really, truly, when our um, our true nature comes out, when we feel um, attacked or when we feel that we need to defend ourselves. Do you behave as God would have you behave? As Christ encountered conflict and people who um, were set against him, Or do you pattern your behavior, say, after your parents, what you saw them do when you were growing up? Or after popular people in the community, people who have had a great influence over you in life? Do you pattern your behavior after them? But is that really always the best way to live? Or isn't it that often we can take those habits, take those ways of life, and not really question them? We adopt them as our own. Where instead, if we were able to let God's word reflect on them, we could take what's good from our parents, from our friends, from influential people, but also not let ourselves be led astray and hurt by the sinful habits that we've observed in life. This can be a very good thing. Just think of the extreme. Someone who grew up in a very dysfunctional, maybe even abusive home. And for them... Having God's forgiveness means that any ways they participated in those sinful habits is forgiven and they can be free from that past and they can go forward and create a family culture or create a way of life that is new and godly. They don't have to be bound to those old ways. That's a wonderful thing. Another area of life that's extremely touchy right now for us uh, since the last couple of years is the issue of racism and discrimination. Without getting into too many specifics, this applies to all the times when we encounter people who are different from us, even if they share our same skin tone. But were you raised, or do you even still think of everyone different from you in negative and insulting terms, in black and white ways, that they are bad and we are obviously good? Because unfortunately, that's some of the tendency that led the Jews to see Jesus in such a hostile light. And really the problem is not so much that we can overlook the good in others, but that we fail to see the sin in ourselves. If we whitewash our culture and the way that we were raised, we sometimes fail to overlook those sinful tendencies that have been grandfathered in. Things that we accept, not because God's word says that they're okay, but because they've always been done that way. But because when I was growing up, everyone talked that way. But really, forgiveness for us then gives us the opportunity to change. And it's not that we look to our unbelieving world 
for answers. Using that building picture again, if you're building a house and you're not quite sure um, about a detail of the building, how to make it safe, that building code actually becomes a very useful tool. So too, it's when these issues in society um, are so bewildering and we're not sure how to make sense of them that God's word often speaks into our time as an outside source and gives us such great clarity. Now, as long as we leave certain parts of our lives unchallenged, so long as we leave uncomfortable parts of our lives grandfathered in, Jesus' blood guilt remains on us. Our sins cry out, let him be crucified. Because by claiming that we have to be right, we're claiming that God, if he contradicts us, is wrong. Right? And this Jesus who speaks God's pure word isn't a good influence for us after all. But because Jesus was crucified, because God attaches such powerful promises for new life and a new creation to Jesus' blood, we can know that Jesus died for us, for our benefit, that he hasn't come for our harm, but to make us new and better people and finally bring us to heaven someday. Now, we don't often think of baptism this way, but Martin Luther, in his great baptism hymn, To Jordan Came Our Lord the Christ, refers to baptism as a blutbad for you Germans, a bath of blood. What a gruesome picture. And yet, because God has promised that Jesus' blood has cleared our record of all the violations of God's code, and that Jesus' perfect life has been applied to us so that through faith we can be brought into line with his code for our lives. Because all of those promises have been made and we believe them, Jesus' blood is not a curse on us and our children, but it is a blessing, a blessing of salvation. So when we come up from the waters of baptism, when we stand after being absolved of our sins, God looks down on us and says, these people are innocent because I can see the blood that paid for their sins covering them. There's already been satisfaction for those crimes. If you look at some old paintings of Jesus crucified, dying on the cross, some painters had angels hovering around Jesus, holding chalices, catching the blood that was dripping from his body. What a powerful picture of how salvation is delivered to us in the Lord's Supper. That that very blood, if you will, is carried you know, by the angels from the cross to your mouth. So that that blood courses through you, leaves no part of you uninspected. But where it finds weakness and sin, it gives cleansing and strength. This blood, far more than the water that Macbeth used, definitely more than the water that Pilate tried to use, to absolve himself of guilt, this blood cleanses. And through this blood, we don't have to leave to our spiritual descendants grandfathered in curses. And I'm not just talking about your physical children, but those people whom you influence spiritually, who trace their spiritual lineage in a way back to you. We don't leave sinful habits grandfathered in. Instead, we can leave grandfathered into our spiritual lives and our spiritual lineages holy habits, faith in Christ, a desperate reliance on this blood, and eternal life through our crucified and living Savior. Amen. Please stand for the blessing. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let my prayers rise before you as incense.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works proceed, give your servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended by you from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness. Through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You may be seated for the closing hymn.
Again, another welcome and good evening to all of you. A special thank you to everyone who served this evening, to our elders and usher, um, to Connor who made the video recording, and also to Kate, our organist, this evening. Thank you very much. You'll see on the insert that you have a uh, schedule of our remaining Lenten and Holy Week services, and so uh, please take that home and save it. Mark your calendars for those services. Just one quick note, um, we have two Good Friday services, which is unusual um, here at St. John's, two Good Friday services in English, I should say. Um, our uh, full service with the, the candelabra and the tenebrae service, the seven words, that'll be our normal 1.30 p.m. service. Um, the 6.30 p.m. service will be a shorter service held in our Heritage Chapel. Um, they will be different services, so if you'd like to come to both, you may. Uh, but we wanted to give an evening option for those who couldn't make it during the day. So just know that those two services are um, distinct services, and you're welcome uh, to both of them. Until we meet again, God's peace. <laughs>